variety of, of studies we've done really focused on mesoscale modeling of uh, both the manufacturing process and the performance of uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, so we're really motivated here, um, similar to the rest of, of you all, is trying to understand the connections between manufacturing, you know, what happens um, in these large scale, high speed roll to roll processes and battery performance. And I think I'm uh, preaching to the choir here in saying that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to understand directly what's happening between manufacturing and performance unless you can understand what's going on in the mesoscale. When you change manufacturing parameters, you're, you're really changing things like the morphology of the uh, conductive binder domain phase, the CBD phase, uh, or you're changing your cracking particles, or you're, you're making other changes to the mesoscale that really are what influence battery performance. And we've really, for the past uh, seven or eight years that we've been working in this field, have been um, focused on trying to understand those connections. Um, and obviously there's a lot of really safety, you know, for us we're at Sandia, we're really interested in, in safety and degradation phenomena, um, trying to make sure that uh, batteries can be as uh, long lasting and safe as possible. And a lot of these mesostructure effects, particularly uh, when you start to look at mechanical uh, environments, uh, can be really important. Uh, so my talk today is divided into three sections. First, I'm going to talk about how we can, uh, computationally represent um, the mesostructure of a MMC cathode. Uh, in, in a finite element code. We'll talk a little, little bit about image-based simulation and a little bit about uh, CBD or carbon binder domain uh, phase reconstruction. We're then gonna talk a little bit, <laughs> this is a great segue from the previous talk, but we're gonna talk about some work that we've done recently um, doing discrete element method simulations to generate mesostructures um, that more physically include the conductive binder domain. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about some electrochemical simulations. Uh, similar to uh, Dr. Mister yesterday, I'd kind of like to take a pause after each of these uh, vignettes to uh, answer some questions since there's kind of a transition between each of these. Um, so I'll, I'll try to make it through all of it today, but if, if not, I'll happy to answer some of the questions at the end. We'll start with the computational representation. So when I first started working uh, in this area, we were using uh, uh, lithium cobalt oxide cathodes, which are highly non-spherical, showing a spherical NMC particle here, for example. But it, we you know, saw the state of the literature seven or eight years ago was really um, focused on, you know, putting spheres in a domain and, um, you know, trying to generate a mesostructure that way. And we were really motivated to try to use images, use 3D X-ray CT images, tomography to uh, create our, our mesostructures. So the process that, that we use uh, generally is, is quite similar to what other folks are doing, where we'll take a 3D image data from an X-ray CT. We'll do segmentation on that process to try to identify the particle phase from the uh, electrolyte and CBD phases together. Um, we'll go through and label the individual particles. This isn't necessarily always strictly necessary, but it's nice to be able to do things like understand particle size distributions, um, understand surface area versus uh, contact area between particles um, and things like that. Uh, we have an in-house algorithm known as the conformal decomposition finite element method that is a really robust um, automatic way to create very large scale, and when I say large scale, we'll often run 300 to 400 million element simulations. Uh, we create these very large scale finite element meshes uh, directly from the image data, um, really in the order of uh, minutes instead of uh, hours and the, um, yeah, the other tools that we've tried to use. Um, we then go after we've reconstructed the particles, we go through um, and typically add the, the CBD phase. And I'll talk a little bit more about our algorithm for uh, synthetically adding CBD a little bit later in the talk. Uh, and from there, we can generate a, a you know, highly resolved finite element mesh um, of, of a large scale domain. So this is uh, about 100 micron on each side cube. Um, that includes both the particles and each particle actually as a separate block or a se separate region in the mesh so we can look at them separately. Uh, the CBD phase and the electrolyte, which I've deleted from the mesh here just to help visualize, but um, all three phases in there. Um, some of our recent work has been to improve the segmentation process. So if I go back to the previous slide, um, you know, we've got some pretty cool, unique technology on meshing that is often a pain point for, for people to be able to generate a high quality mesh for all three phases. Um, CBD, we've done some work into, to, um, you know, come up with some reasonable ways of adding it. But really, uh, as of a few years ago, the image segmentation was one of the uh, outstanding, most difficult parts of this process. Um, and so we've been focusing a lot on using uh, neural networks, specifically deep learning or convolutional neural networks, um, to do segmentation. 
And so here's an example of a graphite electrode. Uh, this is a commercial electrode that was uh, scavenged and, and imaged by Vanessa Woods group at ETH Zurich. Um, and you know, you look at it and your eyes can segment this reasonably well, but yet when you try to make your hand go and do it on a computer, whether it's using you know, Python packages and thresholds and filters or OTSU segmentation or whatever you try to use, turns out it's really hard to do. Um, and so this is my poor grad student's best attempt at segmenting this electrode. And, and I chose a particularly bad slice from the domain uh, to highlight here. But even, even someone who's you know, really motivated and focused on doing a good job of segmenting um, you know, really doesn't do a very good job <laughs> of doing it. Um, however, we've realized that we can use this sort of segmentation that may not be perfect and feed it into a convolutional neural network and get a segmentation out, uh, the, uh, shown here at the right, that's really much higher quality than the original training data and the segmentation that went into it. Um, it can also, you know, the training is an expensive process, but we can um, essentially uh, uh, output, uh, do in inference on a lot of different images very, very quickly with this uh, segmentation process. So essentially it would take a human about a week typically to do their best bet at a single electrode. Uh, and once we have a trained model, we can do inference in the order of, of hours. Uh, something we've been focusing on uh, a lot recently has been uncertainty, right? So when we look at these images, we say, well, you could do a simulation on, on this middle segmentation the human did, or you could do it on the neural network output. Um, those are both you know, reasonably equally valid. Um, we don't know what the right answer is necessarily, but we'd like to be able to quantify our uncertainty in our calculation. So what impact does the geometric uncertainty from a segmentation have um, on the predictions you're making? Essentially, can I put error bars from the segmentation process? Uh, so in, in pursuing that, we've developed these Bayesian convolutional neural networks. Uh, if you're familiar with the convolutional neural network, it essentially has twice the number of parameters, and instead of fitting a single scalar value for each of the weights of the network, you fit a variance and a, and a weight. So you're essentially fitting a Gaussian distribution for every single uh, parameter in the model. But what that gives you is an intrinsic way to probe the uncertainty of that model. The, the variance or the, the width of the Gaussian gets calibrated to some of the uncertainty in the images and the training data. Um, and then what you can get on the outside is a, a, a map that is, shows you where your uh, image is most highly uncertain. And as you would expect, um, we tend to, to get high uncertain regions near the edges or the boundaries of particles where um, it's obviously, uh, you know, you get uh, a continuum of grayscale values. Um, what's really cool, and this is some recent work that uh, I literally just got the final plots of uh, yesterday, um, is we've been able to show that this uncertainty that we get out can be propagated all the way through to physics simulation. So we can give you an error bar um, on your, your physics prediction. And it's also is dependent on the quality of the image. So here's a couple examples of a graphite electrode. Um, and both of these, again, were imaged by Vanessa Woods group at ETH Zurich. Um, here's one that's just called electrode four that um, doesn't look that great, right? I mean, here's the grayscale image on the left. It's pretty hard to tell where there's particle and where there's void. Um, we have a segmentation that does a pretty decent job at it, but I would say I would be fairly uncertain at any sort of segmentation on this electrode. Um, here's another example that is a little more clear, right? You can more clearly see the particles. You can more clearly see the interfaces uh, between each of the particles. And the segmentation, yes, looks a little bit cleaner, but I would say this is an easier to segment image. We can also see that through a number of more quantitative measures. Um, here I'm showing a histogram of the grayscale values for the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Um, you know, a single peak here, right? It would be hard if you were choosing an algorithm to do a naive threshold, where would you threshold this image? Where would you draw a line to say, you know, everything to the left is, is particle and everything to the right is void? Um, on this uh, bottom example, there's, you know, there is a bit of a bimodal distribution. There's a little valley here that you could say, okay, that's where I would choose to do my threshold. But what I want to highlight is the uh, convolutional neural network is not doing naive thresholding. Um, so what I'm showing here in the histograms, the green is the histogram of all of the voxels that have been uh, assigned to the void phase. And the red is the histogram of all the part, uh, voxels that have been assigned to the uh, to the particle phase. If we were doing a naive threshold, the transition between green and red would be a sharp, perfectly vertical line. 
Um, and what the convolutional neural network is doing is it's actually learning shapes, interfaces, uh, things like that to do the segmentation. And it does not do just a naive threshold. It actually you know, is doing something a little bit more complicated. And so this overlapping region or the transition between you know, primarily particle and primar primarily particle and primary void segmentations is relatively wide in this poor quality image and sharper uh, in this uh, higher quality image. And there's a score called the BRISC that uh, is, uh, uses a few different techniques to try to uh, assess the quality of your image. Um, so a high, well, it's not the quality, it's the uh, inverse of quality, I guess. A high number is a bad thing. Uh, so we see the BRISC score for this, you know, electrode four is actually significantly higher than it is for the, the good quality image. But the cool part is at the end of the day, we can actually calculate uh, by just doing three or four simulations, we can calculate an, a distribution. Here shown as a, a cumulative distribution function or a CDF curve. We can calculate a distribution of what our uncertainty is in this image. And this case is for the solidity or one minus the porosity. Um, and while these electrodes have similar mean porosities, you know, 64% versus 60%, um, the standard deviation calculated from our geometric uncertainty is quite uh, significantly different. So for the poor quality image, we have a much higher uncertainty um, than we do uh, uh, for the higher quality image. This is just for something simple like porosity, but you know this sort of uncertainty can be propagated through to calculate tortuosity, electrical conductivity, or even really all the way through to you know high fidelity electrochemical simulations. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about the conductive binder, and this is something we've been thinking about, uh, and 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 super excited. The artistic project is spending a lot of time thinking about this too. Um, over the past few years. So often, and then really until the last few years, it was uh, essentially impossible to see the, car the conductive binder domain or CBD phase in X-ray CT, which is kind of the gold standard for uh, 3D imaging. And it's simply because the X-ray cross-section is, is so much smaller than it is for the active material particle, it's hard to get enough contrast to resolve. Uh, the CBD. There have been a few limited uh, and recent imaging results that suggest where the CBD phase is. Um, here's a really nice image, I think, um, from a few years ago for a graphite electrode that shows the, in, in this yellow phase, the graphite, and in this purpley gray phase is the CBD. Um, what it shows here is the CBD is connecting the particles, and that's really intuitive to me. My, my background is in coding processes and, and coding flows and drying. And to me, it makes sense that you would be getting, uh, A, it's a binder, right? It's there to be between the particles and holding it together. Um, and it makes sense, you know, if you dry slow enough, you'd be you know, creating pendular rings where the CBD is going to come out of solution and, and bind the particles together. And so this is some nice experimental evidence, although it's just a 2D slice, to maybe support that. However, there have been plenty of other studies that uh, show kind of a more stochastic representation of the binder. Right, it's, it's not necessarily coding uh, or, or binding particles together at their contact points. It's more spread out in a fractally structure. So we're not really sure what the correct morphology is, but we are trying to understand is it important. Um, so one thing I want to highlight that our previous speaker brought up um, is nanoporosity. And this is something that uh, we think is, is relatively important. Traditionally, when people think of CBD, they treat it as a dense phase, right? They calculate the uh, the density of, of the polymer binder and the conductive additive and treat it as a fully dense material. Um, however, there have been a number of studies uh, over the past five or six years uh, that have shown the CBD phase is actually um, includes nanoporosity on the order of uh, 20 to 50 nanometer uh, pore sizes. Um, up here is a, a pore size distribution showing, you know, the pores that we typically see, you know, on the order of microns. These are the uh, uh, the inter uh, CBD particle pores, but then within a, C a CBD domain, you see these uh, 20 micron pores. What's really important about this, right, is if you have uh, roughly about 50% porosity, which is what a few of these studies have shown, that means your volume of the conductive binder domain is twice what you think it is if you were just uh, stochastically putting it in there. And depending on your loading, uh, if you have a 95.5, so 90, 98% active material, 5% uh, conductive additive, 5% binder um, domain, you actually have of the pore space, the non-particle space, 40% of that is filled with CBD. Um, so that's quite significant and really something you can't neglect. So why, why, why do we think we care about the morphology? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, NMC particles and most of our intercalating electrodes, they swell upon uh, lithiation. When you discharge the battery, you're sticking lithium in and the particles grow. 
Um, at the same time, you, uh, as you discharge, your electrical conductivity of NMC decreases very rapidly, particularly towards the end of discharge, it drops off precipitously. At the same time, if you have CBD that is between particles, as your particles are swelling, you're actually compressing the CBD. Um, and a paper from a few years ago measured the electrical conductivity of CBD as a function of volume strain, showing that as you compress it, the conductivity goes up quite dramatically. So what we're seeing as we discharge a battery, the intrinsic electrical conductivity of the particles do go down, but depending on the morphology, the electrical conductivity of the CBD network goes up. Um, as I'll show later in the talk, the uh, the CBD is the primary charge carrier. I mean, it is what it is what carries electrons in and out of the network to the particles, and so that morphology must be quite important. Um, and here's just an example of how morphology matters. Um, you know, early on, seven or eight years ago, most people were approximating uh, CBD to, by just putting a uniform coating around the outside of particles. And what you see is if you have a uniform coating, you have a percolating network of of CBD and you get nice electrical conductivity all the way in and out of your electrode. You're going to have very few, uh, very, very little polarization losses from uh, electrical resistance in that case. However, if you have a non, uh, uh, you know, a non-uniform coating morphology like we've been uh, studying and what some of the images show, you can get regions of CBD that are disconnected from each other and may not necessarily form a highly percolating network through the entire electrode. And what that ends up doing is forcing electrical transport through these highly um, non-conductive NMC particles. So again, we think the morphology can really make a difference on performance. Um, so this is some work um, that uh, my uh, colleague Brad Trembecki has done and actually did in collaboration with um, Ashutosh Mystery, who was uh, yesterday's last speaker, where we looked at the impact of these different morphologies, all the way from uh, looking at a uniform coating of binder to what we call this binder bridge approach. So this is a, a, uh, a uh, approach that you can see is, is published here a couple years ago uh, that's not physics-based. It's actually a, a really synthetic way of putting binder uh, in the domain, but it replicates what we think uh, the images look like, and particularly that, that image from uh, uh, 2017 showing this binder bridge between particles. So we're calling this the binder bridge approach. We've also compared this to more stochastic approaches. So this is some of the work that uh, Mystery did uh, during his PhD uh, studies, where he uh, did a stochastic uh, Monte Carlo approach for putting uh, CBD into the domain and has this uh, parameter that he can use to control, you know, whether it looks kind of like a uniform coating or looks kind of like a, a more fractal layer, more bridge-like structure. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to, going to go into great detail here. This has been published. I'd be happy to either answer questions online or uh, uh, send the paper to folks. But what we showed is that um, two things I want to highlight here. One, the morphology does matter. Um, if I look at specific surface area, so this is the avail, uh, area of the particle that's available directly in contact with the electrolyte. Um, you obviously see with a uniform coating, there is no surface area that's available to the electrolyte. Um, but in these other approaches, right, you can get a very strong uh, impact. So that can make a huge difference on the electrochemical available, uh, electrochemical reaction uh, area that's available on the particle surfaces. Uh, we also tend to calculate things like tortuosity, transport through the electrolyte phase, and electrical conductivity. And we also show that these uh, uh, morphologies make a you know, fairly significant difference in, uh, uh, in those values. The other thing I want to point out is uh, we did comparisons of using a dense carbon binder domain versus this nanoporous carbon binder domain. So again, adding twice the volume of CBD, but then changing the pro its properties appropriately, allowing uh, transport through them. Uh, we see a marked increase in the electrical conductivity um, for nanoporous CBD um, and a slight increase in the tortuosity. So uh, in general, right, having more CBD uh, at some point, you know, you can have too much, but in generally having more is a good thing. Um, and I'm going to, I think just for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, skip through this, but, you know, you can calibrate Brueggemann best fits um, for both uh, tortuosity and um, for electrical conductivity. The key thing I want to point out here is, you know, Brueggemann approximations get a kind of a, a bad name in the literature these days, including from me. Um, and it's because right in these highly dense situations, the, 
uh, you know, the general parametric form of Brueggemann approximation is right, but the actual exponent numerical values is not that great. And so like others, we have recalibrated that exponent that's predicted to be 0.5 uh, to match our data better. Um, for tor tortuosity, you can actually collapse all of the data onto a single curve, which is nice, with an exponent of 0.722, so a little bit higher than the typical Brueggemann approximation. Um, and then you could use this for macro scale simulations. The key thing we wanted to point out here on electrical conductivity is folks typically will do a Brueggemann approximation based on porosity. Um, however, this is a three phase system, and particularly when it comes to electrical conductivity, right? There's particle phases that have electrical conductivity, there's a CVD that has a high electrical conductivity, and then there's the electro, uh, uh, electrolyte phase that does not have electrical conductivity. So if you actually take a three phase Brueggemann approximation, right, not just the porosity based one, um, you can get a reasonably good fit for electrical conductivity, even without calibrating. So even with the, uh, the 1.5 uh, theoretical Bergman approximation, you get an okay approximation of the data. You can recalibrate it to 1.65 and get a little bit of a better fit. But uh, the key thing here is you really need to take into account the three-phase approximation for electrical conductivity um, to get the Bergman approximation to work well. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple questions here. Uh, this is my transition to the next simulation. So um, I'll start the live answer. So on, on slide seven is the true porosity for either electrode known, uh, like for porosimetry. Um, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, uh, so yes, the porosity is known and typically that's how folks will do the segmentation is they'll try to match the known porosity to the, uh, the threshold value. Um, from our experience, that still doesn't work that well. If you're going to do a naive threshold, um, it, it ends up picking parts of the phase that are not really in the particle. So we that's initially what we did is say, well, we'll just threshold so that we get the right porosity. Um, and that's not necessarily the best approach. And then I'll answer one more question here. Um, can you improve the BCNN segmentation technique by processing segmenting the SCM or TEM images after processing the CT? So essentially, I think maybe the question is asking if you can um, uh, hybridize, use multiple sources of data. And yeah, that's something we're actually really working on right now, um, bringing in multiple sources of data to train the network to improve, uh, improve its quality. So good question, thank you. Scott, there is a question in the chat as well. So from okay. maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, oh, here I got to scroll down a little bit. There we go. Um, early in the presentation, you mentioned you could quantify the influence of image quality on the electric uh, chemical simulation result. Did you do a similar study based on mesh resolution? Yeah, we have. Uh, we have a paper essentially on our mesh resolution of our uh, technique that's been published a few years ago. I'd be happy to share. Um, uh, we haven't rolled it all into kind of one one result yet, but that's kind of our plan for the upcoming year. Um, essentially, we found, though, that the image segmentation is much more sensitive than the mesh resolution uh, to some of these uh, physics quantities. So thanks for the question. Okay, so in the first part of the talk, we talked about representing the, the microstructure and particularly uh, representing the CBD. And all of the uh, approaches we had were relatively synthetic and ad hoc. Not very satisfying to me, let's put it that way. Uh, and so that made us think of, uh, well, could we start to do physics-based simulations um, of the, the microstructure? Could we predict that um, rather than just kind of, you know, making up a morphology? Uh, so I think I need to click here. Okay, so that's led us to create a series of discrete element method simulations that I'll probably go through quite fast because uh, this looks uh, quite similar to what we saw in, in the last talk. Um, but what we've, what we've taken is a, a, a coarse grain discrete element method approach where we have uh, active material particles um, that are elastic, frictional, and cohesive. Um, they are polydispersed, so we've taken um, a, a particle size distribution from the literature for NMC particles uh, from 3D imaging and created that, poly size, uh, that particle size distribution that spans an order of magnitude from 2 to 20 microns um, in size. We've then added the, the CBD phase that is a coarse grain. So we're not modeling, we're not doing molecular dynamics as you saw earlier, where, we, where you have you know, uh, uh, carbon black particles and polymer particles and solvent. We're treating a, uh, as a coarse grain CBD phase. 
um, that is Brownian. So it is, uh, you know, modeled as a sort of being able to move around as if it is in a solvent. It is al also frictional, also cohesive. And in this case, it's monodispersed with a particle size on the order of about 500 nanometers. Um, I'm really interested to see what impact this particle size, just, or this, the, the size of the CBD uh, particle has. Um, that's just what we chose for this study, essentially because doing a uh, simulation that spans 20 micron to 500 nanometer particles uh, is already quite difficult uh, to do that at uh, 100 micron domain scales. Um, um, I'm listing the interactions here. Essentially, we're using this uh, JKR potential um, for the inner particle forces. Um, this is something I'd be happy to talk to folks offline. I don't have a, a ton of great information, but it is, is a, a relatively new potential um, that represents these sorts of systems relatively well. And then we allow Brownian motion for the CBD uh, gel when it's in the solvent phase to allow it to move around um, as, as uh, if it's uh, in a solvent. And actually, just during the previous talk, I got the uh, notification that our this paper was accepted. So I'll be happy to send this to folks um, uh, after the talk if you're interested. Um, so our simulation, we start with uh, a domain that's 100 microns uh, on each of the two lateral dimensions and 700 microns thick so that we can uniformly disperse the particles at a very low, pro uh, a very high porosity. Uh, we can just place them randomly. Uh, at 90% porosity. Um, the first step is we do this initial compression that is to replicate a, you know, a slurry deposition and drying process where we compress the domain down to about 50% porosity. This is typically the porosity you'll see uh, for an, an as-cast dried but uncalendared uh, electrode. And so we do this uh, with all the Brownian forces on so that the CBD uh, uh, phase can rearrange within uh, you know, wherever it kind of wants to during that phase. We then turn off Brownian motion and we model the calendaring process just by continuing to compress the box but without Brownian motion. And we can do that down to, well, we do that down to about a 30% porosity. That's about as small as is typically seen in any sort of uh, industrial uh, electrode. And then along the way, we can take snapshots at various states of porosity to uh, understand what the domain looks like while it's being compressed. Um, and, and we've done this for uh, a few sets of parameters. So uh, I didn't talk about the, the parameters in the model. Uh, most of them are based on measurements. The two that really are unknown and that we're wanting to study uh, in, this, in this article are the cohesion and the adhesion. So the CBD, CBD cohesion, how much the, the CBD phase wants to stick to itself is something that's really an unknown parameter and we want to study its impact on the morphology. And then also the CBD and active material adhesion ratio. So how much the CBD wants to stick to the particles. Um, and we've done this again for a variety of porosities and for a, a variety of CBD loading uh, fractions. So here's a snapshot of just a single volume fraction of CBD, but changing those um, adhesion and cohesion parameters um, over the span that we consider. So if you look at very low adhesion so the, and very low cohesion values, this bottom left-hand corner, this is just where the, the CBD is not particularly sticky at all. It doesn't want to stick to particles that much, nor does it want to stick to itself. You get a CBT, CBD phase that's relatively dispersed, right? It's, it's fairly equally sp spread throughout the domain. Definitely not uniform. There's areas that are relatively devoid of CBD, um, but you don't see any real structures. If you increase the adhesion, so you allow the CBD to stick to the particles, the active material particles, you get a much more condensed phase, right? You get something that looks more like a uniform coating of CBD around each of the particles, and you get these very large open spaces in the domain. Conversely, on the other end, if you have low adhesion to the particles, but uh, good self-cohesion, you can develop, uh, and I'm sorry, maybe not at first glance, if first time looking at these images, it's not clear to see, but I've uh, squinted at these enough, you can see these relatively strong fractal-like structures that go throughout the, the, the domain. So the CBD wants to stick to itself, but not necessarily to the particles. So all of these parameters um, control things like the pore size distribution. Um, we were a little bit surprised to find out, however, that for most of these, uh, for the three uh, cases over here where uh, adhesion was low and also where cohesion was high, you don't see a huge difference in the pore uh, size distribution uh, 
um, in these electrodes. Where you do see a deviation is in this pink curve, which is representative of this top left corner image. So where the particle adhesion is high, but the self cohesion is relatively low, you can get much larger pore size distributions um, in your electrode. So what impact does this have on some of the physical properties? Um, so we've run each of these through to calculate electrical conductivity and tortuosity um, of each of the electrodes. And so what we're showing here is each of those predictions for both low and high, in the bottom case adhesion and cohesion in the top. Um, and we've tried to compare this where uh, we're available to some experimental data. So in the top set of images, we're showing the tortuosity of the electrode. Um, uh, sorry, we've got a lot of data here. So the open circles are for uh, low loadings, and the closed circles are for high loadings. So lots of CBD in the top here. Um, and then you can see the impact of adhesion right here. Where we tend to see the best agreement with experimental data, which is shown here with the Xs, is in the case where we have low CBD cohesion and high, uh, uh, high adhesion to the particle. So that, that corresponds back to the case where um, we showed the, the more uniform coating looking like microstructures um, than in the previous, uh, than in some of the other cases. That's also where we tend to get the best agreement with some of the X-ray CT data plus the CBD domain approach for electrical conductivity. Um, where in this case, we see the colors are flipped here. I apologize for that. Uh, took a couple images and added them together. Um, but where uh, you get the best agreement tends to be uh, where you have high adhesion and on the lower side of cohesion. So that doesn't say that that's necessarily the right set of parameters, that's necessarily the right physics uh, that are going on, but that morphology tends to agree the best with the experimental data that we have. Okay, so I'll take a short break before I transition to the next thing to answer a few questions. Um, the first question is, did you try to compare performance of your neural network and trainable uh, Wika, the plugin in Fiji, to some other ML algorithms. Um, so we're in the process of doing some of that now. So not necessarily Fiji. We haven't dealt with that much. Um, we are using some of the, uh, like Aviso and Dragonfly, some of the commercial packages, and trying to compare to that. Um, you know, the, the current state of the art in the uh, neural network literature is that a 3D-based segmentation is significantly better than a 2D-based segmentation. And a lot of the commercial software you see actually uh, does a segmentation uh, on each slice individually and then puts them together. Um, so we have a fully 3D convolutional neural network. Unfortunately, that's quite expensive to run, but um, if you've got a few high-end GPUs, you can do it reasonably well. Um, we found that those generally have higher accuracy. We haven't done, I'd say, a super quantitative comparison yet, uh, but that's some work that's in process. Um, the next question is, is CDFEM method open source? Um, it is not, but we would like it to be. Um, and we are hoping in the next year we can go through Sandia's process to license this and, and, and publish it as open source. Um, we have published some of the numerical details about it. Um, we have a couple papers out that, that talk about it. Um, but the code itself is not yet open source. Um, and then one more question. Do you think the algorithm that can assess uh, the image quality is relevant to reduce the uncertainty of the segmentation process? There's a bunch of it for natural images, quality assessment, but not really for um, X-ray microscopy, I'm guessing. Um, not really sure what the, the question is, is asking here. Um, uh, so that, that, I don't know if you're referring to that BRISC score that I, I put up there before, you know, that's really just a, a, an algorithm to assess the image quality. Can it be used to improve or reduce the uncertainty? I'm not, not sure how that would work. I um, have to think about that a bit more. Scott, there is uh, one, one question in the chat uh, okay. from Emiliano, Emiliano Primo. Okay, uh, so the question is, what's the density of CBD and how many particles do you have in your model? Um, I don't recall the actual numerical value of, dense, uh, of CBD. I know that we, you know, we took a you know, common literature value for PBDF, which is our polymeric binder we're modeling, and for carbon black particles, and we calculated the dense density from that. Um, so, sorry, I don't remember the numerical value. How many particles? It's like a few million, uh, and it depends on obviously the, the loading, right? So the, when we have, have larger numbers of active material particles, we have fewer CBD and we have, I think somewhere, maybe a little less than a million in those cases. 
And if I remember, we have up to four or five million in the high, high CBD loading cases. Uh, the one thing I want to mention, though, is that we add uh, the nanoporosity after the fact. So we have dense CBD particles that we run the simulations on, and then we double the volume of the CBD network to induce that nanoporosity that we think is relatively important um, uh, for this process. And there is one, one question from Miliano. How do you calculate the tortuosity from experimental data, slide 17? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I don't recall what we did. I don't remember if that paper actually just uh, showed tortuosity. I, I suspect they actually just published tortuosity values. And that was not our data. That was data from the literature. Um, and what process they, they used, I, I, I don't recall at this point. Thanks for the question. I, I have a question, Scott, if, if I, yeah. I, I can. So uh, OK, so in your discrete element method simulation, you are not simulating explicitly the slurry. Okay, so then how, how do you make sure that the structure, uh, your, your initial condition for the DM simulation is uh, physically sound, I would say. Don't you, you see my point? Yes. <laughs> that, that's a great question, and that's why I was pretty riveted by, by the last talk where you guys actually simulated, simulated the slurry. Yeah, we don't know that, right? Um, essentially, we've uniformly distributed the particles to begin with. We've given them time to equilibrate. Um, under Browning and forces, so we let it sit there before we start to compress uh, for a while. But we have no validation that the slurry has the right structural format at all. So um, super excited to see your work <laughs> where you're, you've studied that a little bit more. Uh, but essentially, we're just hoping that you know the Browning forces are allowing it to move around enough that it's coming at equilibrium with the you know the balance of adhesion and cohesion uh, that it has in that slurry form. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so I've just got about 12 minutes left, so I'll probably have to go through this next part a little faster than I'd like to. But this is where we're moving on to some of the uh, electrochemical mechanical simulations of, of MMC. So moving beyond calculating effective transport properties and actually calculating um, electrochemical performance. Um, so our mesoscale model here is is really probably quite similar to what you see in uh, in the literature for some other um, you know other similar studies. Um, but what we, what I think is relatively unique that, that we tend to do is we like to couple mechanics with electrochemistry. So we're solving all of the typical transport equations, um, you know, lithium ion transport uh, in the electrolyte in the conductive binder and lithium in the particles, you know, electrical transport everywhere, your typical Butler-Volmer reaction rates at the particle surfaces. Now, the two things I think are, are relatively unique about this study um, are that we, we do include mechanics. So we include the diffusion-induced stress of the particle swelling. And then as I showed earlier, that compresses the CBD phase and changes the electrical conductivity there. Um, and so we found that that mechanical coupling makes a quite significant difference in some of the predictions, because just when you're really needing some extra boom from your electrical conductivity, because it's going down in the NMC, you get a nice uptick in the electrical conductivity of the CBD phase. But again, it's very morphology dependent. Um, and then the other thing, right, is we do include nanoporosity. So what does that mean? That means in the CBD phase, we treat it both as a porous media. So it does still have lithium ion transport through the conductive binder, but in a porous sense. So it has a uh, an intrinsic porosity and a tortuosity calculated from a Brueggemann approximation associated with it. But it still does have electrical conductivity as it does as it would. Um, uh, as if it were a solid, right? So it, it, uh, the CBD is unique in that it has both the liquid phase and a solid phase equations uh, solved on it. Uh, and I kind of, I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through some of the details here, but um, each of these things I, I highlighted earlier are based on experimental data. So just to give you a picture of what uh, a discharge simulation uh, would look like, I've got a few different snapshots, uh, and this is a movie I'll play in a little bit. On the left, you can see the heterogeneity in the lithium concentration within the particles uh, during discharge. And what I want to highlight is that you'll see that different particles discharge at different rates depending on their location and their size and their connectivity. You can see the generation of stress here. This is a von Mises stress that will be shown. You can see the current density, so where, is, where are the electrons flowing, and then just uh, the general the over potential here. So I'll play the movie a little bit and then uh, stop it, hopefully. So as I mentioned, right, some of the uh, smaller particles tend to, to lithiate faster because they uh, have a, essentially a higher surface area to volume ratio. Um, so you get quite significant heterogeneities in the state of charge throughout, uh, throughout the network. Uh, 
um, throughout time that actually leads to changing where the electrical current goes. So it's primarily going through the CBD phase. Um, early in time, it starts here closer to the electrolyte and then tends to shift up towards the electrode to move away from these larger particles that are becoming less influential later on. Um, and then what you see is a generation of, of uh, mechanical stresses that are typically at these particle-to-particle -particle contacts, um, as I highlighted earlier. Um, we, we've been able to validate this uh, mesoscale approach with um, uh, some experimental data and with a macro scale P2D scale model uh, that we've calibrated from the effective properties um, that we use to calibrate uh, that we can calculate through this simulation. And essentially what I want to highlight here is that we can get quite good agreement with the experimental data and actually better than what you would get from a P2D model um, uh, that's, that's just kind of naively used. Excuse me, primarily because we, we do have that extra, extra resolution on the particles. Um, I'm going to skip this just for the sake of time. Um, you know, what's cool about a mesoscale simulation is that you can really dive into some details and look at what's happening, um, you know, at a much more detailed level as you progress throughout the simulation. Um, one thing that we were wondering about when we started modeling CBD as a porous media is, well, how much does that actually restrict transport to the particle electrolyte surface? Is having a lot of CBD contacting a particle a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, and our conclusion in this case is, is actually a really good thing to have CBD in contact with the particle surfaces. And let me show you why. So if CBD were completely blocking the interface and disallowing um, a Butler Volmer reactions to happen there, you would be losing quite a, amount, uh, quite a significant amount of, of available surface area for the reaction, and it would have a strong detrimental effect. However, by allowing it to have 50% porosity, which is, again, what was experimentally measured in a few studies, um, and allowing that transport to the surface, and allowing reaction at that surface. Now, the, because it's 50% porous, you only have 50% of the area um, under the CBD you can still get quite a significant amount of reaction um, under that interface. It is, it is slightly penalized because it has to transport through this tortuous media and it has less surface area, but it can still get there, and in, even at relatively high C rates, I believe this is a, a 2C rate discharge, um, you get quite significant reactions under the, the surface. The benefit of that is later in discharge, which shown here, you get, uh, because the electrical conductivity of NMC is so low, it can actually be difficult to transport electrons from the electrolyte exposed surfaces to the CBD to transport it out because it has to go through NMC itself. And what I'll show here, I think on the next, uh, next slide, is that late in discharge, it's actually preferred to react under CBD at interfaces that are under the CBD because of the ease of electrical conductivity um, than it is to react at the electrolyte exposed surfaces. So essentially they're equally, you know, pretty close to equally weighted early in discharge. And then late in discharge, you see a preferential reaction under the CBD um, to avoid that uh, polarization loss of electrical conductivity. Um, and so, you know, where, where are the losses? So these are some plots essentially looking at what's the uh, polarization, each of the polarization losses for every single individual particle as a function of the particle size. Um, and where we generally see the largest losses are at the uh, largest particles, um, tend to have some of the uh, larger losses. Um, at, and that tends to be also late in discharge. Um, so you're reacting, uh, these particles are, are mostly reacted, but to get the rest of it out, you need to really pull stuff from within the particles uh, and get it to the exposed surfaces. But transport out uh, of electrons can be, um, you know, some of the rate limiting steps here. Okay, so I know I went through that last part, last part a little bit fast, but I want to make sure I've got time to take a, a few more questions. So just, you know, in summary, um, I think we have a fairly unique and well-established um, image to mesh, mesh capability that can really allow us to um, efficiently and, um, and robustly take 3D images and create computable three-phase uh, mesostructures that can be uh, used for finite element simulations. Uh, we presented some physics-based uh, mesostructure generation techniques using discrete element, uh, discrete element methods and then have applied this to a variety of lithium-ion uh, battery cathode calculations. Um, 
So with that, I'd like to say thanks to all the folks who, who have helped with this work. I've had a number of students and collaborations over the year, years, um, funding from Sandia and from the Department of Energy in the US. And I'll leave a few publications up here and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Scott, for a very great presentation, as usual. You, you bet. So I've got one more question here. Um, so the question is, how is the structure generated by the DEM simulation converted into a computational mesh? Essentially, how are the point contacts between AM and CBD elements realized? So we used uh, the exact same technique to generate um, meshes from DEM as we did from uh, the image-based technique, and this namely this conformal decomposition finite element method. Uh, the way that that method works is you take a, a surface description of each particle, so like an STL file, faceted, a surface description and use that to create the volumetric mesh. So for the image-based simulation, we generate STL files using, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, you know, we surface mesh the segmented image. From the DEM simulation, we can just directly generate it because it's spheres and that's that's pretty easy. So we use the same um, same same technique there. And the point contacts between AM and CBD, you know, that's always a challenge, um, and that I think is one. Um, one advantage of our CDFM approach by labeling the individual particles, we can actually um, sharply realize that that point contact. And these are elastic particles, so they're not you know infinitely small contact points. They're generally quite small, but um, we can resolve those reasonably well with our CDFM method. Okay, next question: uh, Which is the cycling stability of the battery electrode materials as a function of the charge discharge process? Um, so we actually have not done any cycling um, simulations here. All I showed was essentially a single discharge. Um, uh, we could do the the cycling simulations, but that's just not what we have focused on at this point. So um, I have essentially uh, not a whole lot to say about that. Um, and then the next question here, um, how have you calculated the potential with the simulation? So um, let me just go back um, over here. So in our uh, electrochemical simulation, um, the Butler-Volmer equation utilizes, um, you need to specify the open circuit voltage um, for this system at the interface. So that was taken from data from this uh, citation right here. Um, and then how do we calculate essentially the open circuit voltage for the discharge? Uh, we're just calculating the mean voltage at the current collector, so at the top of the interface. Um, and so as you can see here, that is different from the open circuit voltage because of all of the polarization losses, because you have losses from uh, electrical conduction, because you have losses from ionic transport, and because you have essentially just an over, uh, uh, an over potential that drives the Butler-Volmer reaction rate. Um, so we directly measure the um, the performance, you know, the actual uh, voltage curve for a discharge, and then we can back calculate what those different polarization losses are. Um, the question is, how do you differentiate, differentiate CBD from active particle when the active material size is similar to CBD? So for small particles, I'm assuming it's a size-based identification. So in imaging, you typically don't see CBD. Um, there have been a few studies in the past few years where they have seeded um, the CBD phase with iron nanoparticles so that they can image them. Or, you know, if you're doing really detailed SEM, you can see that. Um, but we have not actually done CBD resolve from image-based simulation. Um, but in order to resolve that, you'd have to have some sort of contrast difference. So if you could see it in X-ray CT, it would have to be a different grayscale value. Um, from the DEM simulations, because we're you know, we're doing simulations, we can, every particle is tagged as either being active material or CBD. And so we can essentially intimately track that throughout the simulation uh, natively. Uh, the next question is, do you plan to include the separator and its lith lithium reservoir in electrochemical simulations? Yes, and we're actually doing that right now. Um, in the electrochemical simulations we showed right now, um, we essentially just had a constant lithium concentration at the uh, cathode uh, separator interface, knowing that's an approximation and that you can get at high C rates, you get losses through the separator. Um, some simulations we're doing now, we're actually modeling, either combining you know, mesoscale graphite, mesoscale uh, CBD and, um, and the separator itself and having porous transport uh, in that. And that's some stuff we're looking at right now. But yeah, that's uh, not done in the current simulations. 
Next question, is your discharge simulation dependent on the current distribution of AM and CBD, or is it calculated from the average? In the latter case, how many distributions for a good prediction? Um, so I, th I assume you're just asking about heterogeneity both within the material and sample to sample. Um, so, uh, you know, for the current distribution, we actually uh, model a current collector and we apply our boundary condition to the far side of that current collector. Um, and so because the current collector has high electrical conductivity, if there's any heterogeneity within the material itself, it allows the current to redistribute naturally to go through the areas where it would, uh, you know, essentially want to go where there's conductivity. So that's a fairly uh, realistic simulation boundary condition that we think is accurate. Um, for both the DM simulations and for the image-based simulations, however, we have done multiple realizations that we've pulled from um, for the images we've taken, you know, five, I think is what we've done in most cases, five different images for the same electrode. Um, and then what I presented here in most cases is an average. And in some cases you've seen error bars and that's essentially the, the variability. Um, we found that, you know, on the order of three to five realizations is sufficient to at least characterize your variability and uncertainty. You know, you can calculate a standard deviation from that and put some error bars on your simulations. Um, uh, for the for the DEM simulations themselves, you know, we found that doing uh, three realizations, you know, gave a reasonable mean and standard deviation. So that was typically sufficient. Great, uh, Scott. I think there is more questions in the chat. So I mean, the questions are raining. <laughs> so okay, great. <laughs> All right, uh, Teo. So we've got. Um, let's see. I've got a couple questions. Um, Comment a bit more about the accuracy we, we can expect in terms of CBD locations by adding it to the X-ray CT images and in general, the binder bridge press. Well, you know, so that's a great question and something that I think we're still studying and have not run to ground. That accuracy, um, you know, essentially what we did is we said, well, you know, five years ago or six years ago, we were saying, well, no one's looking at CBD um, and that's wrong. So we need to add CBD. So we, you know, we came up with this binder bridge approach just because we thought it was physically intuitive. We then did these comparisons with the work of uh, Partha Mukherjee and, and Ashutosh Mystery and their stochastic thing and said, oh man, the morphology actually matters, right? You get different results depending on different morphology. And that's what's led to this work of doing the DEM simulations to, to try to predict it. Um, so what is the accuracy of adding it back in? I think that's still to be determined. Um, you know, the work of your group and, and the work that we're doing, I think is, you know, at the cutting edge of trying to actually predict that morphology. Uh, the one thing I can say is that morphology matters. Um, what I th think we still don't have a good answer to is what is the right morphology? And what I'm hoping is that, you know, further simulations, comparisons to experimental data and improvements in imaging techniques where we actually see the CBD phase uh, is gonna do nothing but help, right? It's going to help us understand what, uh, what the correct morphology is. And there's probably not one right answer, right? I, I strongly suspect that if you dry at different rates, you get different morphologies. And I think what we need to better do is, is understand how those manufacturing processes impact the morphology um, and, and, and find a, a, a physics-based way of simulating that morphology. Uh, so the second question here is considering the segmentation of some images are extremely challenging. They can expect some error in this in the segmented images that are used to train the CNN. Is there a way to assess the effect of human-related error on the accuracy in the CNN model? Actually, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, that is a challenge. Um, what we have shown experimentally, uh, well, I don't want to say experimentally, but um, you know, through through just doing the work, is that even with bad labels, the the CNN generally will do a better prediction. And it's because as a whole, you're capturing the shapes of these particles. When you give it a segmentation, it doesn't have to be perfect because what you're trying to train the network to do in 3D is recognize that it's looking for particles, that it's looking for interfaces, that the particles are generally shaped you know, spherically or, or in platelet-like particles. And even if it's not a perfect segmentation, um, the CNN can still learn what it's looking for and produce a better result. What we found is that by assessing the uncertainty of the network, um, that uncertain, the uncertainty that's, that's given by the network is strongly tied to the, the quality of the segmentation that's fed into it and the quality of the images. You can take that uncertainty and, and use that to refine the images. So in areas where there's high uncertainty from the network, you can actually flip the decision that's being made. So if it, 
if it assigned it to one phase, but it had a high uncertainty, you can actually uh, turn it into the other phase and use that to retrain the network. And essentially, you can improve the quality of the network by feeding its uncertainty estimates back into it. Um, and so we've got a paper from last year uh, at a computer science conference that we, confer uh, that we uh, published that kind of addresses that. So yeah, this is still a really, I think, exciting area of, of research, you know, how to quantify uncertainty and how to use that uncertainty to improve uh, predictions. Um, but in general, I'll just say from my experience, I, I, I'm, uh, as of a couple of years ago, was a pretty big naysayer of machine learning. I was not a fan. Um, and at least in this area of, of image segmentation, um, uh, it really does a pretty good job. Okay, and the last question here from Teo was, if I remember well in the article that you published today, in order to model the solvent evaporation and compression of the structure until uh, reaching the desired electrode thickness, which was 30%, in this sense following the computational procedure solvent evaporation and calendaring looks quite similar. Yeah, so the, um, the only difference between our solvent evaporation step and our calendaring step is the lack of Brownian motion. And, and we know this is an approximation. We are, we are not modeling, oh, yeah. What I would love to do is model solvent transport during the actual uh, drying process, right? And to an, uh, answer some of the questions that uh, were given to the previous speaker, I'd love to look at like at really high drying rates, the transport of CBD towards the top, right? That's been experimentally observed that you can get a layer of of, of dense CBD at the top if you dry quickly. Um, yeah, those sorts of things are not going to be captured in our model. Um, the only difference between calendaring and uh, drying for us is that we turn off CBD. So we've essentially said there's, or sorry, we turned off Brownian motion, essentially saying there's no solvent to allow that Brownian process to take place. And then we just continue compressing. Great. Uh, I'm going to flip back to the questions here then. Uh, I've got one more question. What do you, uh, click the button. What do you think will be the next big thing in image segmentation? Do you think CNN will be useful? The CNN needs a large amount of data, which might be difficult for material science. You know, so um, machine learning always gets a bad rap because it needs lots of data. However, in the area of image segmentation, a single 3D image has a lot of data, right? Well, oftentimes these images are 2,000 voxels or 3,000 voxels in each dimension, right? That's billions of voxels. Um, and so what we have found is that for, let's say, NMC particles, you can, you can train a single, um, you can train a CNN to segment NMC particles from a single manual segmentation. And what we've shown is that that segmentation doesn't have to be that great, right? You can do an okay job of manually segmenting. Use that to train a CNN. Um, and it can, it can work on just that single data set because a 3D data set has so much data in it. Um, right, so for things like trying to, to correlate manufacturing parameters to tortuosity, right, that, that, that I think is exciting, and, but it can still be pro problematic because of the lack of data. Um, but for image segmentation, I, I think it works fairly well. Um, yeah, next big thing, I'm super excited about some of the work that's coming out using uh, uh, generated adversarial networks, GANs, to actually predict and create microstructures, right? So there's some uh, work that Sam Cooper uh, in the UK is doing, uh, a paper that just came out in uh, he's going, uh, he's going material to... science a few days ago, right? Uh, that... to... Tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah, super cool work <laughs> um, uh, on, on actually predicting this. So what I, I mean, that's what I'm excited about right now. Can we take what we've learned from images? Can we take what we've learned from DEM simulations or, or uh, MD simulations? combine those and actually create mesostructures, create them, right? Create new ones without having to do expensive physics simulations um, using machine learning. Um, and then can we control parameters, right? Like what would be super cool to me is if we could, you know, train a model based on real data, based on simulations, and then say, I'm gonna study the impact of all these parameters. I'm gonna generate mesostructures um, cheaply and efficiently. I, that's, that's what I'm excited about right now. Yeah, that's great. So I think there is still a question in the, in chat. the chat. Okay. Chat, yes, again, for Emiliano. Yep, going back to the second part of your presentation, uh, how did you manage to add nanoprocessically stochastically to the CBD phases? No problem with meshing and computational costs. Thanks for the presentation, yep. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't go into that in great detail. So we did the DEM simulations assuming CBD was dense. And then we expanded, uh, essentially ex yeah, expanded the volume of each of the CBD particles so that the entire network had double the volume. 
So that was an, an iterative process because the particles overlap. You don't know how much you need to change the radius of each of the particles to get the whole uh, electrode volume to be double. Um, so that was an iterative process. Um, you know, all of these things are computationally expensive, um, right? Doing DEM simulations with mi millions of particles and, o and over an order of magnitude uh, difference in particle size is expensive. Um, creating 300 million element meshes is expensive. Um, five years ago or 10 years ago, it would have been prohibitively expensive. Um, now it's doable. Um, you know, you can't do it on a desktop. I don't think any of any of these simulations can be done on a, a workstation computer in any reasonable time. I think you need high performance computing to do it. Um, but for example, in our DEM paper, uh, the one that was uh, just accepted today, you know, we did uh, I think 180 DEM simulations to span this parameter space and to do replicates. Uh, that meant we made 180 meshes and then we did tortuosity and conductivity in each of the three directions. So it was like close to a thousand finite element simulations. Um, and I think all those calculations ran, you know, in a couple of months on HPC resources. So it's expensive, but um, it is doable. And does the meshing respect particle surfaces? Yeah, I didn't go into great detail about our meshing technique, um, but the advantage of it is that it exactly captures the surfaces. Um, because it takes, uh, I didn't talk about the details, but it, because it takes in an, a representation of the surface, that's how you represent the particles in the meshing technique. It begins by placing nodes at those surfaces and then creating, uh, adjusting the rest of the volume mesh to those uh, nodal surfaces. Um, so we've done, you know, solution verification studies where we look at, you know, what kind of mesh resolution do you need to capture the surface area? Does it converge? with mesh refinement and all of that. And the thing that's easiest for us to capture is, is volume and surface area, right? That works very well, um, just because of how the algorithm works. So thanks for the question. Great, Scott. I think, uh, I think that's all.